The Last of Us starts out how all good zombie games should, from the perspective of a 14 year old girl waking up because she's scared. I walk around the house looking for my dad, but he's not in his room or anywhere to be seen. On the news is fire and carnage, but it's actually sad because it's happening here in America and not some made up country overseas. I also notice my dad has a Stairmaster in his room. The summer booties are built in winter, good man. My dad Joel comes home and he's panicking, saying the neighbors are acting strange. He's not wrong. He proceeds to eliminate Mr. Cooper and then we get in the car and head for the highway because no one else will have thought of doing that. On the way, this nice little family asks for our help, but this isn't an Uber pool, so we just leave them to die. Who would have guessed the roads are busy? We're forced to move on foot. We now control Papa Joel and I ensure to show my daughter what a zombie encounter looks like up close so she can gain some valuable life experience and hopefully have a cheap laugh or two. She mostly just cries. It's not really seeming safe in the city, so we flee to the outskirts. We made it. We're finally free and safe. This soldier is then like, yo, what's good? I'm going to shoot you. And he does, and my daughter dies. A glass half full? She would have slowed us down. Welcome to The Last of Us, a true gaming masterpiece. It's now been 20 years since the outbreak. We live in a semi-safe Boston that's being controlled by the military. Joel and his mate Tess work as smugglers, bringing things in and out of the city walls. I don't mean to sound like an art student with blue hair, but democracy may actually be dead this time. As we're heading out of the sanctuary to meet our contact, there's an attack and we're forced to take another route. If an apocalypse ever happens in real life, I hope I can be as chill as this guy sleeping with pet pigeons. That's what good mental health looks like. We sneak through a tunnel and emerge to the big beautiful world. Anything outside the sanctuary was bombed relentlessly in an effort to kill everything. They didn't get this guy though. He begs for a mercy kill, but bullets are crazy rare, so I leave him to recover. This game is quite sad for a magnitude of reasons. Like over the last 20 years, I don't think Joel has used a Stairmaster once. I'm surprised his jeans aren't falling down. That ass is making his daughter's flatline look curvy. We arrive at a shanty village that has a market not too dissimilar from what you might find in today's real world. You've got a sneaker store where you can cop a fresh pair of entes. You've got a guy frying up rats. A real one-stop shop for all your needs. We meet this woman called Marlene and she says she'll give us weapons and potentially an over the pants handy if we help her. I'm obviously paraphrasing the story slightly. It looks like she's been shot and is clutching her waist to ensure she doesn't bleed out. I imagine it isn't a wise idea to hang out with almost dead people during a zombie apocalypse. A platoon of soldiers try to stop us, but everyone knows highly trained military professionals are no match for three middle-aged characters with plot armor. We come across three of Marlene's best friends who aren't looking too great. It must be hard for her to watch, but at least the exquisite sunset softens the blow. Perhaps if Marlene stopped crying and bleeding everywhere and just enjoyed the little things, she wouldn't be such a wet blanket. She introduces us to a girl named Ellie and says we must smuggle her out of the city. It's a pretty wise choice to trust Joel with this task, as the last time he tried to watch over a young girl, she was fatally shot almost immediately. We head through a sneaky little tunnel and emerge on the other side of the huge city walls. We are now free from the soldiers and nothing could ruin the mood. Moments later, we discover that Ellie is infected. What a dodgy malacca. The soldiers spot us and we have to flee. Ellie explains that she was bitten weeks ago and never turned, which means she could be the cure to this whole virus. If you can't trust a 14 year old girl who's aware that you're strongly considering shooting her, then who can you trust? We continue moving towards the drop off point. The path we take is scattered with corpses and it's impossible to know how they died. I'm thinking this guy spent too much time around 4G mobile towers. This guy is clutching a notebook. He's written an extensive recollection of events that led right up to his death. Maybe if he stopped keeping a journal and shot more bullets, he'd have survived. He also wrote a note at the end which says, like the video if you want part two. The sun rises and we reach the Capitol building where Tessa's friends are waiting for us. They're all part of this group called the Fireflies. It's the perfect cover as it sounds like they're just a bunch of gender confused acapella students. I'm sure long term they won't ever regret working with Joel. We head inside and Tess is like, yo, I got bitten too. She wants to sacrifice herself and hold off the pursuing soldiers who just arrived. I'm so on board with that plan, it seems like a win-win. Tess is like roast pumpkin. Great to have on your plate, but you're not going to miss it when it's not there. You also wouldn't bang a pumpkin. I keep a low profile, eliminating guards only when necessary to conserve ammo. We leave the Capitol building and it's a beautiful day, so naturally we head straight into the dark, scary subway station. We now believe Ellie's immunity to the virus could lead to a cure which could save humanity. Speaking of the virus, this is exactly what you want to be doing when there is a rapid spreading infection. Swimming in sewerage water, surrounded by mosquitoes and deteriorating bodies. Ellie and Joel begin working as a team as their bond slowly grows. Just a man in his 50s and a 14 year old girl. Nothing could ruin this relationship. Not puberty and definitely not 18 rounds of golf. 
We come out of the sewers into a forest. The plan is to get Ellie to a hospital controlled by the fireflies several cities away so we can make this cure. She's excited to see the trees because she spent her entire childhood behind concrete walls. Imagine being excited to see a tree, what a loser. That's the church we've got to get to so we can meet our mate Bill. He apparently owes us many favours because Joel did some off-camera mining for him. We move towards his location. Now that we're outside the sanctuary, the infected are everywhere. For now they're not too much of a worry as long as you're sneaky. Bill has also set up explosive traps so we're relatively protected. I attempt to push Ellie into one of the tripwires but she doesn't allow it. I even use guerrilla style tactics but she's less phased by the explosion than a Syrian property developer. I swear to god 90% of this game is just using planks to cross gaps but somehow it's perfect. We continue searching for Bill. He's left these cute little signs everywhere. It doesn't even say intruders will be shot, it just says you will be shot definitively. I like that. I open a door and one of Bill's famous traps snares my leg and I end up hanging upside down in a warehouse. It's at this moment an entire horde of the undead rush the building. It's starting to feel like Bill isn't a great friend. He's almost killed us several times with traps and I was joking. The messages he wrote about shooting us obviously aren't cute. They are really insensitive and hurtful. Then like an angel on a redemption arc, the big man appears and cuts me free. We flee the warehouse as the infected come from every direction. I couldn't find the button to pick Ellie up and throw her at the horde to buy the precious seconds we need, but we end up not having to sacrifice her, which is fun. And Bill shows us where he's been living. It's an old bar with the windows all boarded up. Clearly Bill doesn't understand the importance of natural light. It looks like he's also been playing chess by himself, which is the saddest thing I've ever seen in my life, and I was holding my daughter in my arms when she was shot. He says he knows where a vehicle is, and so we head towards that location. As soon as we go outside, another horde collapses on our position. It's more than fine though, as we have a rusty revolver with four bullets. The clickers get closer and closer until one of them latches onto me and passionately kisses my neck. It's really welcomed in a world void of intimacy. We continue moving through the city towards our escape. There is a pile of burning bodies which is pretty messed up. Just because there's a zombie outbreak doesn't mean we can get crazy with the CO2 emissions. A Bill gives me a shotgun which makes light work of just about everything. I've also been crafting nail bombs which are good, clean, family friendly fun. As we move through the derelict back alleys, Joel is confronted with a demon from his past. I see a Stairmaster 3000 while passing through a garage. Imagine the booty Joel could have had if he'd spent 15 minutes a day for the last 20 years climbing his way to a positive self body image. We reach the house where the car is and Ellie climbs into the driver's seat where we try a push start. Pretty smart letting a 14 year old girl who's never driven and probably can't reach the pedals take the most important role of this operation. The other day my mate's car broke down and I had to help him out. I was the one pushing and I pushed too hard and strained my back and then I stood up suddenly which caused me to stumble over to the driver's seat, sit in his lap and kiss him on the lips and then we made passionate love for four and a half hours. It's crazy how hard it is to push start cars. We say goodbye to Bill because besides saving our lives several times in quick succession, what's he really done for us? We arrive at another city that seems peaceful except when we pull in a group of survivors throw bricks and stones at our truck. The super unwelcoming and hostile energy coming from all of these people. I'd recommend they curl up in bed with a good book and practice some mindfulness because bad attitudes are contagious. I kill them all except when beating down this last guy he gets down on his knees in a puddle and begs for his life. This gives Joel a great opportunity to better himself as a person. You see I'm pretty bad with the bow and arrow but this is a really easy target and I use it to boost my confidence. Ellie and I head inside a warehouse and it becomes immediately apparent that these guys are probably cannibals. Well you know what they say, a friend will help you hide the body but a best friend helps you eat it. Their sleeping quarters are terrifying. There's a zombie apocalypse and suddenly everyone forgets about feng shui and mood lighting. Speaking of lighting, I regularly shine my torch on Ellie's face because if I don't, who will? We continue moving through the city as we're humanity's only hope. While Australia and New Zealand are probably just chilling all healthy and normal, probably wondering why none of the other countries are returning their faxes. After hours of gameplay I discover that stealth is often a better strategy than just killing everything. I then reach into my pants, feel my manhood and get right back to absolute murder and chaos. It's clear the guys I'm fighting don't really like soldiers. I'm an empath which means I can easily tell this just by looking at the atrocious public displays of violence. Truly horrific but also undeniably creative. Ellie and I continue moving through the city using teamwork and friendship. Joel and Ellie's bond grows as they realise they need each other. For example, Ellie can't understand why a model like this would choose to be skinny in a pre-infection time where food was so easy to obtain. Joel explains that this mentality is why Ellie will die single and alone. We continue moving through the city that we now desperately must escape from. 
While passing through a building, Joel decides our best bet is to climb into the elevator shaft. Everyone knows navigating elevator cavities without the correct equipment is safe and smart. I boost Ellie up, but in the process fall five stories landing on solid metal, but Joel swims it off because he's chill like that. This part of the game is scary as it's wet and dark and there are infected everywhere. At least someone put a wet floor sign up. That's really courteous. I shoot my way through a fair few enemies, get the generator up and running, but unfortunately the lights and sound attract a big, big girl. These are known as bloaters, but I prefer to call them ex-girlfriends as they all have the same weakness. A Molotov cocktail to the face. I make it out of the basement, except just kidding, I'm viciously attacked via a quick time event. As Joel's lungs begin to fill with water, so does his stomach, so at least my boy will die hydrated. Then out of nowhere, Ellie shows up and shoots the guy attacking me. She's a hero. Or at least she would have been if she didn't get all mopey and sad about it. Her post-kill body language is extremely depressing and negative. She shoots one person and acts like she spent three years on the Eastern Front. Now that she's a stone cold killer, Joel gives her a rifle and says cover me, putting guns in the hands of teenagers. Now I know how African warlords feel. Invigorated. With Ellie covering me from the roof, we systematically take down the entire patrol. It's actually working out pretty well for Joel. His original daughter died and then he meets this girl who is slowly becoming his new and improved daughter. The original child was annoying. She was always having bad dreams and getting shot. Ellie is my very own Chris Kyle. Right as we're planning to sneak out of the city, we meet two brothers named Henry and Sam. We decide we'll work together for a while. Rule one of any apocalypse, always trust people you've just met. Joel gets eight hours as there's no substitute for a good night's rest and then it's time to escape. The darkness of night allows us to sneak around easily. We even do some Call of Duty synchronized takedowns, which is a surprisingly great way to become best friends forever. The city gates are heavily defended, but they're busy taking out the infected, which allows us to creep through. We're almost home free, except then some kind of vehicle begins chasing us. Henry and Sam have an ethical decision to make, but they immediately leave us for dead. I haven't felt this betrayed since my girlfriend told me she doesn't actually ever buy me new toothbrushes, she just gives me her old ones. Of all the things you don't want pursuing you, an armored Humvee with a 50 caliber machine gun is pretty high on that list. Our only option is to jump into the river below. Joel doesn't want to, but Ellie insists he must trust her and take the leap of faith. Hooray for metaphors. We wash downstream and get knocked unconscious on a rock. Several hours later, Henry and Sam seem to have saved us and so we forgive them immediately because rule two of any apocalypse. Always forgive people quickly, even if 15 minutes ago they literally left you for dead. We all push forward together. We must get to the Fireflies controlled hospital and save the world. This game is absolutely amazing. It might even be my new number one of all time. I've always played on Xbox because the Stealtho boys play there, but it's been great checking out some PlayStation exclusives. If you enjoyed this video, hit like. Rah, 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 I love you. See you soon.